is extremely great. Julian could be on our plane to the United States uh, within well, it's a complete unknown. But the reality is that uh, that he could be on a plane within days. We have a public hearing, thankfully. The previous hearing was uh, sorry, the previous judgment was by a single judge behind closed doors. We dismissed our 152 application for an appeal in a three-page reply. The public hearing next week will be before two judges, uh, Johnson and Sharp. And it is the final hearing if it doesn't go Julian's way. There is no possibility to appeal to the Supreme Court or anywhere else in this jurisdiction. Don't they believe in the possible the Espionage Act in the state would be used against the purpose of appeals? That has now happened for the first time. And we see it spreading. And also, if you were working in this country, you should know that uh, in December, uh, the National Security Act with, uh, came into effect here in, in the UK uh, an uh, act very much inspired by the US Espionage Act and uh, is threatening whistleblowers and journalists according to men. So we need to push back and uh, this is, uh, uh, in this case, Julian's uh, uh, fight for Julian freedom is a fight for journalism. It is not about him, it's about you as well. Thank you. For Justice Harry here, we defend Julian Assange because of his contributions to journalism we believe that this case has alarming implications for journalism and press freedom around the world, not least of all, as he would be the first publisher tried under the U.S. Espionage Act, which lacks a public interest defense. This means that this precedent could be applied to any others that uh, publish stories based on leaked uh, classified documents, so that could affect any journalist, any mainstream media organization anywhere in the world. We will be in court next week. It's worth mentioning that there have been a series of uh, access problems throughout these four years of extradition proceedings. We're very much hoping that uh, our conferences in court will be respected next week. But it's worth bearing in mind, too, that this has been a quite abnormal experience for NGOs and for some journalists covering the case as well. I'll leave it at that for now. Uh, last time there was a public hearing, Julian made the same request to be able to be in person, in court, to be able to ask for clarifications um, and consult with his lawyers in court. Uh, he was denied this possibility. He was given access via video link, like a spectator, um, like any of you who might who might uh, use a video link to see what's going on. It's completely absurd. Uh, I hope the court grants permission for Julian to be at his final hearing in the UK. Uh, but even that is an unknown, and it is part of the, the greater absurdity of this case that just keeps on shocking uh, me and, and everyone else. Julian has been in Belmont prison for almost five years. He was taken there on the 11th of April, 2019, and he has not spent a single day except for outside in court uh, in the very beginning. Uh, since since then. And I'll remind you that the last time Julian, Julian was allowed in court was on the 6th of January uh, 2021 in person. Julian was sick over, over uh, Christmas. I wasn't able to visit him during those days that he was sick. It was about a week. Uh, I'm very grateful to the High Commissioner who we asked to intervene um, with the Russian authorities in order for him to see a, a doctor because he was promised a doctor uh, several several times and uh, it was only after the intervention of the High Commissioner that he was actually able to see a doctor. His health is in decline, mentally and physically. His life is at risk every single day he stays in prison. And if he is extradited, he will die. 
But it's not just about him being extradited. Julian should never have been put in prison in the first place. Thank you. And just uh, just another question about the hostage art stunt. Andre Molotkin threatening to burn up all those, to destroy all those paintings if he's not released. What do you make of that? Have you been working with this Molotkin? Um, what is it? What are your thoughts? Um, to me, this this piece of art is about preserving Julian's life not about destroying uh, anything. I, I don't know if you're all familiar with it, but the, the, um, it's artworks that have been placed in a safe, and if Julian dies in prison, the artwork is destroyed. The point is to save Julian's life, and that is uh, the, artist, uh, the artist's uh, intention, stated intention, and it's not him in isolation, he's actually had other artists donate their own works and collectors as well. Uh, so it's a joint effort by the art community to do something about the situation. And I just want to mention, we haven't talked publicly about this before, so this is the first time uh, we're referring to our prison visits in this way. Last April, we were actually arbitrarily barred access for, to, to a confirmed visit that we had at the prison. Uh, on the grounds that the prison had supposedly received intelligence that we were journalists and our arguments that we were visiting as an NGO frankly didn't matter on the spot. But after months of various interventions, we finally gained access, although the prison uh, insisted on some restrictions about our communications around it. We agreed at the time because given the possibly urgent uh, situation here, if Julian is extradited eminently, we thought it was crucial to be able to visit him while we still can. Uh, what we're speaking today. We, two of us, uh, my, my, my boss, Chris Dutton, well, the Secretary General of RSF, and I uh, went in two times together in uh, August and September, and then I went in two additional times, the last of which was just a few weeks ago. Um, we've been able to speak directly to Julian about advocacy efforts in his case. It's really important that groups like ours are able to speak to him directly, and he has the right to know what is being done on his behalf. He has the right to visitors, and we have the right to visit him. We've also spoken about his situation and his conditions in Belmarsh Prison. Um, our interventions finally helped the situation where he's been requesting access to a typewriter for three years. He's now been given a typewriter. The last visit was uh, shortly after Christmas when Stella mentioned he was quite ill. Um, I was very concerned by the state of his uh, health. At that stage, he had coughed so much that he had broken a rib and was in a, a lot of pain. So his situation is pretty grim now. But of course, um, the understanding between all of us and, you know, for Julian himself is how much worse it will be in conditions of extradition and long-term detention in the U.S. It is a matter of life or death. I'd like to refer to the statement of the U.N. Special Rapporteur on Torture from just last week, who again uh, spoke of the mental health risks and the risk of suicide and urged the U.K. to halt these extradition proceedings. So a growing number of calls by experts around the world, in addition to the free expression community, the human rights community, the media community, um, and policy makers around the world. Enough is enough. It is time to bring this judicial tragedy to an end. Um, to your question about uh, what's happening next week, so we are going to, um, it's an application, it's a renewal application, uh, and we're bringing it, so that means that we will, um, our arguments will be presented on the first day. Uh, the US will probably reply on the second day. And in terms of when a decision will be taken, that's really um, up to the judges. Uh, they could announce a decision the same day and then uh, say that their written arguments would come up in due course. That's happened before. Um, we are, of course, extremely worried that the case uh, that the case may uh, that the decision may be taken uh, immediately, and that the Home Office will move to extradite him. Uh, very well. That's basically what, that's what will happen once there's a final decision in the UK courts. Um, the extradition process begins. Um, in terms of the 
the legal arguments, I put out a tweet uh, detailing the, the legal arguments that, um, that goes through each of them in, in detail. Uh, the focus, of course, um, is on Julian's uh, work as a journalist. He, the, the expedition itself violates his Article 10 rights to freedom of expression. Um, reporting criminality by a state is not a crime. Uh, Julian is also the victim of a murder plot that was reported in uh, the press widely, widely, but not as widely as it should have, um, by the U.S. administration under the under CIA Director Donald, uh, sorry, CIA Director Mike Pompeo. Uh, there was reports that there were sketches and options about how to assassinate Julian, and that CIA Director Mike Pompeo um, was obsessed with Julian. Um, and that he discussed murdering Julian at the highest levels of the White House. So one of our arguments is that this evidence has to be taken into account, of course, and uh, the extradition should not be granted, um, even if just on this, on this report, which by the way, Mike Pompeo confirmed. I mean, he said that the sources, which were over 30 of them, anonymous and also named the highest levels of the U.S. National Security Council. Uh, the sources should be put on trial for violating the Espionage Act. Not for libel, but for violating the Espionage Act for disclosing state secrets. Um, there's also a um, one of the points is the uh, fact that Julian's extradition violates the UK-US extradition treaty, uh, Article 4, which prohibits political extradition for political offenses. Uh, the, uh, sorry, I've sick for a week. Uh, the espionage uh, charge, but I'm better now, the espionage charge uh, charges under the Espionage Act, which are 17, amounting to 170 years for receiving, possessing, and communicating information to the public, literally even just in isolation, communicating to the public national defense information as defined by the U.S. government, uh, is a political offense. On the face of it, the uh, on the letter of the law, the extradition treaty between the U.S. Uh, and the U.K prohibits this extradition. It is banned by the Extradition Act, i oh, sorry, by the US-UK Extradition Treaty. But because the Extradition Act is silent on political offenses, um, the original court found that this ban in the treaty was not enforceable domestically by Julian. It's complete absurdity. Um, Please, please, please look at my Twitter feed for each of the each of the arguments. Just to uh, one one, uh, if you could be precise on this, if Julian Assange wins next week, he's not free. If he's free, if he's if he wins in this week, um, Julian will then be. That means he will be granted a full appeal. I mean, we're at a stage where he has been denied even airing his full arguments in court. We're having to go to uh, two judges to ask them to be able to air the full arguments in court, at the high court. Uh, so if he wins this round, that would mean it would go to a full appeal um, and he would be kept in, in Belmarsh prison. So, uh, okay, um, okay. Julian <coughs> and Christine. Judith, uh, 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 Judith here from Um If, as you fear, uh, the judge 
is done immediately, mm -hmm. and then the Home Office starts moving to extradition. Will you have time then to request an order for the of the European Court of Human Rights, or is that then going out of the way? Sorry, this is about actually part of the, the, the first question, uh, whether Julian will try to appeal to the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, this is not an automatic um, right. The, the European Court has to uh, admit the application. Um, he will, of course, make an application. Uh, he can only go to the European Court of Human Rights once he has exhausted domestic remedies in the UK. Um, and uh, there's also uh, uh, the remedy of a Rule 39 order from the court to tell the UK to stay extradition. Of course, Rule 39 is the subject of uh, a lot of news stories. Recently, we all know the government's uh, position in relation to uh, deportations. And um, this is, of course, of, of uh, great concern. Um, but in order to violate Rule 39 order by the court, uh, the UK would have to uh, violate international law and its obligations under the European Convention of Human Rights. So uh, we will definitely, immediately, uh, in case of a loss, apply to the European Court of Human Rights for a Rule 39 order to stop an extradition. Uh, as well as the full application, bringing up all the points we've raised over the years, um, that Julian's human rights have been comprehensively violated, systematically violated, for years and years, since, his, uh, since the publication of, of um, the cables in 2010, Julian hasn't been free. And since the extradition request in 2019, uh, the the U.S. has been abusing the legal process in order to persecute a journalist and imprison him for publishing true information about war crimes. That is the precedent that is being set. Thank you. Christine. Um, Christine, I have from German Radio. Uh, the uh, 
the hard drives contained legally privileged conversations between Julian and his lawyers, which had been specifically targeted, as well as instructions to obtain the DNA of our six-month-old baby, um, and uh, we have since um, also obtained more uh, information. Some of these hard drives were not um, properly offloaded by Spanish police, and the judge um, uh, found out and uh, ordered them to uh, submit uh, the information that had been withheld, and that has um, has rendered uh, uh, much more information, uh, which uh, some of which, uh, well, which I don't think I can go into right now. But there is a live uh, investigation in Spain. It is progressing, and we expect it to go to trial. And in the U.S., uh, four U.S. citizens have sued Pompeo and the CIA. The lawsuit against Pompeo has been. Um, dismissed by the judge uh, for him personally, but the lawsuit against the CIA is uh, progressing, and it is for, because the CIA, through this spying operation inside the embassy, and we know so much because of these whistleblowers in Spain, and the information that was obtained from the hard drives um, showed that they, uh, the CIA had been violating the Fourth Amendment rights of American citizens. So that's the case. The US, sorry, the CIA has just invoked uh, state secrets privilege in order to um, try to avoid any scrutiny on it violating American citizens' rights in this case, and the judge is yet to call on that. If uh, Julian is extradited, of course, that fight will continue. The organization will continue the fight for its freedom. But I want to point out that WikiLeaks is hampered somewhat in actually operating in the United States for a simple reason. Lawyers have uh, advised WikiLeaks staff not to travel to the United States. And uh, look at it in the context of, uh, of uh, uh, not highly recognized the declaration by Mike Pompeo in March or April 2017 when in his uh, first uh, public uh, speaking engagement he highlighted uh, the danger from WikiLeaks and defined the organization as quote unquote uh, non-state hostile intelligence service. Nobody took uh, much notice of that uh, at that time, but it was a highly thought out legal definition, which we now know was, uh, uh, was designed to justify the plan to kidnap or assassinate Julian Assange. Uh, this has been exposed now in very credible reports that have been still pointed out to confirm. But of course the fight will be taken to that ground, but we certainly hope that will never come again. Uh, the last visit I was able to go on was on the 3rd of February. Um, I had another visit, but I was too sick to attend. How do you find him? I'm very concerned about how he's doing. Physically, he's, he's aged prematurely. He's only 53. Uh, he's on medication. As you know, in October 2020, one, he had a mini stroke, um, and he has all sorts of health uh, problems from being in a uh, three by two uh, meter cell for five years. He's in there for over 22 hours a day. He's isolated. Even if he paces up and down the cell, there's only so much you can you can do. Um, so I thought that the deepest of the ability to France 24, having covered this from the very first day and being in court, when he went for an interview and got arrested, and then spent his first night um, in prison, um, although he'd been bailed. It's extraordinary to find ourselves 13 years down the track. What happened, and I think there's a sudden incomprehension, 
certainly it would be for the public and also possibly for some of our media colleagues and indeed me in the fact that was it two years ago I was standing outside the old baby just at the end of the pandemic and uh, that judgment came down, I think it's Judge Moritza, anyway, the point is that she refused the extradition on the grounds that Julian was a suicidist and that this could not be coped with adequately in the US, in the US system. Uh, that seems to have somehow disappeared from the situation. What are the possibilities of that really being acknowledged indeed in the worrying uh, last report you say from your, your last visit of the dire conditions, physically and mentally in medicine? Let me take this opportunity to <coughs> point out the misreporting that has been on the so-called U.S. assurances about what happens if Julian's extradited. These are not assurances. For one, they are conditional. They do not stop the U.S. from doing anything. In fact, they license the U.S. for putting, for putting him in the very conditions that the Reds have found would drive him to kill himself. Nothing's changed. All the, medical, uh, all the medical evidence was accepted at the High Court. The medical evidence shows, and there were uh, psychiatrists both for the US and the defense, and they both coincided that Julian was at risk of ending his own, own life because of the oppressive conditions that he would have to endure if he's extradited to the United States. Who determines what conditions Julian will be if he's extradited to the United States? Intelligence agencies, the very same intelligence agencies that plotted to murder him. And it's a national security case. They don't even have to ju justify why, it, to their mind, they recommend to the US uh, Board of Prisons to place him in solitary confinement. The, uh, the ruling just came down in the Schulte case. Uh, this is the, the alleged source of the uh, WikiLeaks public education of Vault 7. And he has been held under special administrative measures, which is a clearly torturous um, uh, uh, euphemism, a euphemism for torture. Uh, he, is being, he is isolated in his cell when he's taken out uh, to exercise. It's into this uh, space as big as a parking lot when he has been able to access um, classified information in order to mount his defense. He's been placed in a room where he has had to uh, urinate and defecate into a corner uh, because he's not allowed to leave uh, to use the toilet. He's locked into this room where he's is the only which is the only place he's, he was allowed to read these uh, documents, um, access these documents. Julian will be put in a hole if he is extradited. May there is no doubt about that. He will put, be put in a hole so far and deep in the ground that I don't think I'll ever see him again. And after 13 years of enduring abuse and torture, do you really think a person can survive that? Just to add, um, on the same lines as the diplomatic assurances, which are in effect political, it is worth remembering here today and next week that this remains a political case. So none of this is actually inevitable. Whatever happens in court in the UK or perhaps in Strasbourg, the US government still at this moment has the power to drop this case, to bring this to a close. So it's worth bearing in mind that there are ongoing political negotiations. Um, the Australian government has, of course, been making representations. Um, as he is an Australian citizen, um, and many officials, including the Prime Minister, again just yesterday, have 
called um, for this to be brought to a close, we would ask from reporters without borders that there should be a political solution, but that it must involve no further time in prison for Julian in any country. But it is a political case. Please, do not misreport on the diplomatic, so-called diplomatic assurances. If you do not have access to the wording of these assurances, I'm happy to uh, point you to where they are. They are conditional. They say if the U.S. decides to put Julian under special administrative measures, which is what I just described about Schulte, then they will, if they deem they have reason to do it. There is no prohibition of putting him in the very conditions that will kill him. And if you report that there are assurances that he will be well treated, I think um, it's not only misleading, it's malicious. Um, let me see your hands for questions. Uh, Susanna, um, okay, let's start with you, Susanna. Um, 
the statute under which Julian is indicted, the Espionage Act, is political. It needs a political solution. Because if you try to give a, a judicial explanation to this, um, you're left clueless. You don't understand what's going on. There are conversations going on, both um, the Prime Minister, Prime Minister um, Albanese and um, the Attorney General, who just um, met with uh, the Attorney General of Australia, who has also confirmed that he has met with the Attorney General of uh, the United States, uh, Garland, and that the Australian um, Attorney General also raised Julian's case with his counterpart. As you know, probably uh, the Australian government backed a resolution uh, which passed in Parliament, in the Australian Parliament, uh, two days ago. Uh, it had two thirds of Parliament's support, 84 uh, versus 42, I think. Um, and I think if the wording had been tweaked a bit, a, a bit the opposition probably would have backed it too because the head of the opposition has also said uh, that Julian should be able to come home, he should not be in prison. There is a unanimous um, position by the Australian Parliament and the government. Um, Prime Minister Albanese also uh, made a strong statement um, in, a, in a, a television program uh, just yesterday. The Australian government does not want to see Julian extradited. They want to see Julian home in Australia. And uh, of course Australia is a very extremely uh, strategic ally to the United States and uh, their position has to mean something. And I'm hopeful uh, that, that um, these efforts are continuing and that Julian um, that they're continuing and that they'll, in time, in time, because it's a race against time. It's no good if, if, if these political conversations go on um, and Julian's in a prison cell in the United States in a hellhole, isolated from the world. Um, he doesn't, he doesn't, he can't afford any more time. He's already given five years of his life in a high security prison where he is not convicted of any crime. He's not serving a sentence. Five years, think about that. And then his liberty has been, of course, limited in one way or another since 7th of December 2010, just seven, sorry, 10 days after we started publishing Cablegate. That's the first time he was arrested. Yes, just in terms of what could actually be negotiated, just to emphasize that point, he has served nearly five years in prison already. If the US government is unwilling to back down on the principles underpinning this case, if they're unwilling to drop the tra charges entirely and release him as they should, there is a possible solution to consider this as time served and to let him go now with no further time to be served. It's worth bearing in mind he is not the leaker. The leaker, Chelsea Manning, already served seven years in prison. President Obama commuted her sentence, stating that the 35 years she had been sentenced to were disproportionate compared to other cases. So it's frankly absurd that the leaker, who has already been in prison for seven years and has been finished, now that the publisher would face possibly 175 years, it does not make sense in any, in any country, in any legal context. So quite possibly, we can see a situation where it could be offered just to consider this as a done deal and to let him go without continuing this legal harassment for another decade. And just add, think about the implications for all of you. Uh, Cynthia, and then you. Hi, Cynthia Massa from the Spanish National Paper, the reason. Um, the, the case of all these uh, legal battles is very complicated, so um, I, I beg your pardon uh, at the beginning because uh, I, I try to understand uh, what is the current situation. As they were said, that uh, in case that uh, um, he wins uh, the extradition case, uh, he still is going to be in prison. So um, could you please tell us, I mean, what is 
the exactly situation. He is in prison in the United Kingdom because uh, um, he violated a parole uh, for a case in Sweden that is already closed. So what is the reason that he is in prison nowadays? Okay, I'm sure if you want to uh, take you as well. You mentioned the political avenues. Um, we hear a lot in this country from the politicians that Parliament has to be sovereign over law. And that is the tone that we hear from the present government. We seem to hear very little from the government as well as the opposition. What is involved in terms of political avenues in the United Kingdom rather than in Australia or in the United States? In terms of the, uh, the proceedings, this is basically an administrative hearing um, to, uh, if, he, if he wins this round, then it will go to a full appeal. It's not that if he won the extradition, uh, case altogether, he wouldn't be free. The only thing he's been doing in prison is this extradition request from, from the United States. And um, so he would, he would be, he would remain in prison um, because every time we have tried to uh, seek bail for him, it has been denied. Of course, the, the, the legal um, reasoning uh, so far has been that he's a so-called health risk, but let's think about it. Julian applied for political asylum in relation to a US extradition in 2012 to the Ecuadorian government when he entered the embassy. The application is public, the decision is public, it references Chelsea Manning's torture, it references the UK and, the U and Sweden refusing to give an undertaking that he would not be further extradited, and it was granted. It was granted. It was the political asylum was granted on this basis. There was an imminent risk that he could be sent to be tortured in the United States, just like his source, Chelsea Manning, had been in the same case. Uh, if I may add uh, about the the uh, hearing next week. The victory there is just uh, um, will just mean that Julian will be allowed to present his case in the appeal court. That is what is at stake here. Uh, it, uh, it of course will then be a continuation of the case, which should never start in the first place and should end immediately with dropping of the charge against Julian in the United States. But it will then go on for. We don't know how long uh, this procedure has been uh, marked by this prolonged uh, creeping time frames in between. It has been going on and on. We call it punishment through process. It is an, an obviously deliberate uh, attempt to wear him down, to punish him by taking this long. Just imagine that the original uh, request for appeal went in uh, to the courts in uh, September in 2022. Uh, it took 10 months for the judge, Justice Swift is his name, to come up with two and a half page of no argument, but simply, I read all through this, I don't see any ground for appeal, and now we are here, eight months later, to go again to the judge, two judges, to ask their opinion of their colleague. So this gives you a, 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 a sense of the time frame this has been going on. Five years while he lingers and slowly dies in prison. Thank you. Just about well, of course, it's discretionary for the Home Secretary to not um, endorse the arguments of, uh, of Priti Patel, the previous Home Secretary, who actually approved this, this extradition. 
the Home Secretary is the second respondent in this case. It is against the United States and uh, appealing the, the reasons that the Home Secretary gave, gave for, for not blocking this extradition. So of course, uh, Mr. Clowney could um, review and should review uh, his position and there was a uh, letter from Australian MPs asking uh, the Home Secretary to, uh, to do just that. Okay, we're coming to the close, so let's grab the last two or three questions. Let me see your hands. Uh, definitely Dagmar, if you've asked one already, just please wait, we will also have a few later. Um, anybody who hasn't asked and who's done to ask, Dagmar. So, you know, we have one feeling. Yeah, I think, Jenny. Um, do we have any ideas about the two judges uh, on next week? Uh, the judges, uh, Sharp and Johnson, are um, the ones who are going to be hearing this case next week. I obviously have to be careful with what I say on my opinions here. Um, but there are two articles, one on each of the, each judge, that has been, uh, that um, are, uh, being published tomorrow, I think, um, in Declassified. Oh, the children. Um, well, Julie and I, and I protect the children. <laughs> um, they they don't know, frankly, they don't know. And they don't think it's fair on them to know what's really going on. Rebecca, if you want to just give us a last view of all this thing to judge. Just, again, to cut through all of the other speculation, all of the noise around Julian Assange and what this case is about. It is absolutely about journalism and press freedom and the public's right to know. It impacts every journalist, every mainstream media organization, every, every one of us, because we have the right to know stories in the public interest. 